hopefully it's recording. Yes, it is. Okay. So we will start our discussion of the solo model today. Move the picture. And hopefully they will be able to see what's on the board. If you guys that are that are um, viewing the class remotely need the camera moved, let me let me know and we'll try to reposition it a little bit. Okay. So Ben, if you will, kind of during as I move from one side to the other, just kind yeah. of just gently yeah. tilt that. <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead and start our discussion today. We'll we'll, we'll start um, looking at some of the basic elements of the solo growth model. As we go through each of these models, we're going to basically take the same approach. The first part of the discussion, what I'm going to do is talk about the various features of the model. In other words, the people or the agents that are inhabiting this pretend economy, what are they doing, right? What are their characteristics, their traits? How do they interact with one another, all right? We'll talk about the basic structure of the model first. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can solve analytically for an equilibrium outcome of that model. These are all going to be dynamic models. They describe the macroeconomy over time. And so the equilibrium solution that we're going to be focusing on in a lot of these situations is something called a steady state. That is, a, it's sometimes referred to as the fixed point of the model, where the main economic variables settle down into a steady state position and all else equal won't fluctuate any longer okay we're going to look at whether or not these models exhibit or admit a unique steady state equilibrium we're also going to try to discover what the stability properties of these models are in other words if we start from some arbitrary initial point in the economy are we always going to gravitate towards that long run steady state equilibrium okay what are the conditions that are necessary to to um, achieve stability and a unique steady state equilibrium that's kind of be, going to be sort of the approach in each of the various models that we're going to look at the solo model is no different okay so the solo model um, provides a basic framework then for thinking about the proximate causes and the mechanics of economic growth. Now I say proximate causes because the solo model does not tell us really anything about the deep root causes of economic growth. To get at that stuff, you need to really take a, um, a deep dive into the endogenous growth theory. But the solo growth model can tell us at least proximately where growth comes from. And it's no big mystery, growth comes from um, growth in, in technological progress over time, something you probably learned in your intermediate macro class. I still think it's useful for a variety of reasons, however. Um, it can enlighten us about some of the potential reasons why we see these large cross-country income differences. Why are we rich in the United States, for example, but people are you know, desperately poor in sub-Saharan Africa? The solo model can help provide some first answers to that by computing comparative statics on the steady state of the model. What conditions of the model are conducive to high levels of long run growth, right? What is it that makes countries rich versus make, making countries poor? Solo model is useful for that. And also, just from a purely mechanical perspective, the main features of the solo model appear in the optimal growth model. They appear in the Ramsey neoclassical growth model. Um, and so particularly things like the production function um, are, are embedded into these larger, more complicated, modern macro environments. And so it's good to start here. All right, um, let me start then by looking at uh, a discussion of the basic economic environment. And we will begin that discussion by looking at households 
and production. All right. The solo model assumes that the economy is inhabited by a large number of perfectly identi identical households. Okay, everybody is the same. So the economy essentially admits a trivial kind of representative household. Right, that means that if we want to talk about things like aggregate demand or the economy's total amount of labor supply, we can focus on just the behavior of a single representative agent. It's a simplifying assumption. Okay. Now, with that said, these households are not specified at the level of preferences, that is the level of a utility function. We're not going to be solving anybody's individual utility optimization problem like you would in a microeconomic context. We will later on when we talk about the OLG model or the neoclassical optimal growth model, but not in the solo model. Instead, we're just going to apply a simple kind of rule for the behavior of these households, and that is that households in the solo model are going to save a constant fraction of their income every period, which means they consume a constant fraction of their income every period. Okay, that's the that's the only decision they make is they they save and consume a constant fraction of their income. That's a, that component is exogenous to the model. When we discuss the OLG model and future models, that savings rate is going to be endogenized. It's going to be the outcome of a utility maximization problem. Okay, all firms in the solo model have access to a common production function for a unique final good. We live in a world where we consume lots of different types of goods and services. The solo model assumes that there's only one good, a final output good that is produced commonly across all these different firms. So like there is a representative household, we can also make use of a representative firm in this economy. Um, and the behavior of that representative firm determines aggregate supply. It also determines total labor demand, right? Because workers are used by the representative firm. Okay, this representative firm is assumed to produce this common final good according to an aggregate production function. And I'll define what these concepts are here in a minute. Hopefully you guys have seen this before. This is what's known as a production function. Y is the economy's final output good. It is a homogeneous good. Okay. Um, that good can be used for consumption, but it can also be used for saving or investment, right? The way I like to think about this is that the good being produced, you can think of it as corn, right? Jasmine, you can certainly eat corn, that's your consumption, but the farmer can also take the corn and use it to grow more corn in the future. So it's a homogeneous good, right? Um, or, or pigs, right? You can slaughter the pig and have the pork Right, or you can breed the pigs to make new pigs, right? So that's that's what we're talking about in this model. There's one homogeneous good that can be costlessly shifted between consumption versus savings and investment. Okay. Again, these are absurd assumptions, but they're used to simplify the analysis. KT, what is that? That's the stock of physical capital in the country. Okay. This is also in terms of the economy's finished good, right? So this is corn that we're using to grow new corn in the future, right? What is LT? That is the amount of labor that is employed by the representative firm. And AT is going to denote the state of technology, all right? Now, LT is expressed in units of either time or in the total number of workers, right? There are 100 workers in the economy. That's what L is. K and Y are expressed in units of the actual final good in the economy. That is, pounds of corn or number of pigs. Okay. AT has no natural units. It is a much more kind of nebulous concept. You can think of it mainly as a parameter that shifts the production function F in a way that makes 
the inputs into production more productive, right? So for example, let's say that there is an advance in technology where workers and capital become more efficient. So A goes up and therefore the same amount of capital and labor can suddenly produce more output. A has effectively shifted the production function to do, to do that very thing. So A doesn't have any natural units like labor or capital does. It's, it's just a mathematical device to capture this idea of technological progress. These little T's here, you guys familiar with those? This is what's called discrete time notation. All right, in this class, we're going to cover everything in discrete time as opposed to continuous time, which looks like this. I don't know if you guys spend any time in math camp talking about continuous versus discrete time. In a continuous time model, time is on the interval, right? And you can actually take the derivative of these variables with respect to time to look at their rate of change, instantaneous rate of change. Okay, here time is discrete, right? It takes on values of zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And so you can't take the derivative of these variables with respect to time. What you do in, in discrete time models rather is take differences, right? So for example, this notation here is kt plus one minus kt. That's the change in the capital stock from one period to the next. Or if you want to put it in terms of a growth rate, you can write kt plus one minus kt over kt, right? So we won't be taking derivatives with respect to t, we'll be taking differences. So the models that we're going to develop are, are nonlinear difference equations over the variables in the model. They will show how these variables evolve over time in a dynamic fashion. Um, one last thing I want to mention about these various goods. Um, capital and labor are rival goods. You guys know what that means? Labor, for instance, is a rival good. If the representative firm hires Ben to work at the plant, that means another firm cannot hire Ben, right? It's a rival good. Technology is a non-rival good in this model. One firm's use of technology does not preclude another firm's use of that same technology. It's more or less a public good. Capital and labor are rival goods. Technology in the solo model is a non-rival good. It's also non-excludable. That means something slightly different. A good is non-excludable if one can't take actions to prevent someone else from using it, right? So one firm can't take certain actions to prevent other firms from using a technology. Public good here. So it's, it's both non-rival and non-excludable. This class ends at 445. Is that right? Okay. Any questions so far? Let me move on to the second part. And that is a discussion about resource allocation. Can you guys that are watching remotely see everything okay so far? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. I can't uh, a little bit more. Yeah. Sorry? Not very clear. It's not very clear. Let me see. What if we, is it better now? Or is it the glare from the light? Is yeah. that better? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Maybe I ought to just put it on the front row. I'll try to remove it. Um, okay. Let me talk about the resource allocation. Then. So we're going to assume in the solo model that the economy is closed. Okay, that means there is, and there's also no role for government. So there's no trade with other countries and there's no role for government. That has an implication then about how resources are, are allocated. All right, specifically, the economy's supply of the final good, YT, must be equal to 
total consumption in the economy plus total investment. So CT is total consumption, IT is total investment. That is, how many goods you're using to produce future goods and services. Um, now you guys may remember this accounting identity from principles, but national savings is just output or GDP minus consumption. Since there's no government spending here, it's just Y minus C. Well, we see here that this is exactly equal to investment. And so what do we have in the solar model is an equality between savings and investment, just like we see in our macro principles class. Okay, looking at this identity helps us think about how re resources are allocated. Remember, what is the key assumption about household behavior in the solo model? It's that households save a constant fraction of their income. This means then that total savings in the economy is just gonna be equal to some fraction, let's call it S, of total output, okay? Where S is some constant. What does this imply then about aggregate consumption? If savings and investment is just S times Y, that means consumption is one minus S times Y. So this simple behavioral rule, this constant savings rate, shows how the total resources in the economy are allocated between savings or investment and consumption. A fraction S of resources goes towards investment. The other fraction, one minus S, gets consumed. In the future models that we're going to talk about, this S parameter will be endogenized in the sense that agents will determine optimally how much to consume versus how much to save by maximizing a dynamic utility optimization problem. Okay, let's talk about the evolution of the inputs in this model. So there are three. The inputs are the arguments in the production function, capital, labor, and technology. We're gonna make assumptions about how these inputs evolve over time. The first thing we need is that the economy's initial conditions have to be given. So the world has to start somewhere. Right? What's given in the problem is some initial stock of capital, labor, and state of technology. The model will then describe the subsequent evolution of these variables over time. Okay, LT is meant to reflect the total working population. So the solo model makes a very simple assumption about how this variable evolves over time, and it assumes that the, po the working population grows at some constant rate. N, okay? So LT is simply going to be equal to 1 plus N times whatever L was in the previous period, okay? And we can assume, let's say, that N is some you know, small positive number. In this model, households supply their labor to firms inelastically. They don't really make a labor decision. In other words, if, Jasmine, you have one unit of labor that you can supply, you go and work that full shift, and you get a wage in return, okay? So, and we're gonna assume that everyone in the economy works. So the population is the same concept as total labor supply. And so the labor supply then grows at whatever the population growth rate is. Let's say 1%, 2%, whatever. Technology. Here's the most meaningful simplification in the solo model. We're going to assume that the state of technology grows exogenously at rate G. So inputs into the production process, capital and labor, grow at a fixed exogenous rate. I'm sorry, the state of technology grows at a fixed and exogenous rate over time. Now this is a really important assumption and You'll understand this a bit more as we get 
later into this model in future lectures. But what you're going to find is that the secret sauce, so to speak, in a solo model that enables permanent growth in living standards over time, as measured by something like per capita incomes, boils down to growth in the state of technology. Without it, the model is going to predict that things like output per worker and capital per worker settle down to a state at which they're, they're no longer going to grow. But we know that even in an advanced, developed economy like the U.S., we tend to have growth in living standards year after year. What the solo model tells us is, is that if, if that comes from anywhere, it has to come from growth in the state of technology. Okay? What the solo model doesn't tell us, obviously, is where that technology comes from. Right? Well, if it all boils down to growth in, in technological progress, the model is really silent on where these new technologies come from. Right? And so that's what opened up this whole area of what's called endogenous growth theory. Right? Sarouche is an expert in all of that stuff. You'll spend some time next semester talking about some of these endogenous growth models. Um, Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for his contributions to that field. Okay? The basic solo model is an exogenous growth model. We don't try to explain G, it's just G, okay? Um, capital. How does capital evolve? So labor and technology evolve in an exogenous way. By the way, I'm using these two terms a lot, exogenous versus endogenous. I hope everybody's familiar with that. Exogenous variable is a variable that is an input into the model. It's taken as given. An endogenous variable is an output, right? It's something that the model predicts. That's, that's what economic models do. They're try, they try to tell us how exogenous variables affect the endogenous outcomes. One of the inputs is an endogenous input, and that is the capital stock. If the amount of capital today is given, how do we determine what the capital stock is going to be in the next period? Well, what are the forces that are acting on the capital stock over time? There are two, right? There's something that causes capital to go up, and there's something that causes capital to go down. What is it that causes the capital to, to go down every period? It's a natural process that, that describes how capital wears out over time called depreciation, right? Capital doesn't last forever, it depreciates, okay? So you said it's the only or endogenous. It's, it's, yes, and it's endogenous for the following reason. So the capital stock tomorrow will be equal to how much capital is left over from the previous period that hasn't depreciated. So delta is the depreciation rate. Let's say it's 2% per year, something like that. So if we have 100 units of capital today, then we're going to have 98 units of capital in the next period. Well, what is it that prevents the capital stock from eventually going all the way to zero? How do we augment the capital stock every period? With what? Investment. Right? We eat corn, jasmine, but we also grow more corn. Right, That corn that we put into the ground is investment. And that's why it is an endogenous input, because this is one of the endogenous variables in the model, investment. And so it determines the evolution of the capital stock. So this is how labor and technology evolve over time. This is how capital evolves over time. job this semester. Okay, any questions so far? You guys that are participating remotely need me to move a camera or whatever, just, just shout out, okay? All right, um, with the last, let's say, 15 minutes of class, I want to talk about um, the, probably the most important feature of the solo model, and that's this thing called the neoclassical Production function. 
We call it the neoclassical production function because we make a series of assumptions about the properties of this guy over here so that the model will render unique stable solutions. Those assumptions are gonna basically hold throughout the semester. That's why this is so important because this type of production function is gonna make an appearance again and again and again, okay? Now, here's a point where I'm gonna, for instance, just read from the, uh, the lecture uh, notes. I'm not gonna put every bit of notation up on the board because I'm lazy. So for those of you who have it or, or whatnot, you can, you can uh, refer to these. So <clears throat> assumption one, the production function, this F term here is a function that maps elements from, let's say, three dimensional Euclidean space into the positive reals, okay? It is continuous. It is twice differentiable in K and L, and it satisfies the following conditions on its partial derivatives, okay? So the partial derivative of F with respect to K and with respect to L are both positive. You guys hopefully are familiar with this notation. So F sub K is the partial derivative of F with respect to K. That's assumed positive. F sub L is also positive. That's the partial of F with respect to L. That's how much output changes from a unit increase in the capital stock. In other words, what is this? That's the marginal product of capital, right? What's this over here? It's the marginal product of labor. The neoclassical production function says that those two things are positive. If you increase the capital stock or increase labor, you're gonna get more output, not less output. The other part of the neoclassical assumption is that the second derivatives with respect to K and L twice are negative. In other words, the marginal product of capital is decreasing in the capital stock. The marginal product of labor is decreasing in labor. So if you increase capital, you increase output, but at a decreasing rate. In other words, the production function exhibits diminishing marginal returns to capital. It ex exhibits diminishing marginal returns to labor, right? Each additional unit of capital and labor boosts output by less and less. The production function is strictly concave in K and L. The last critical part of the production function is that F exhibits what's called constant returns to scale in K and L. You can remind me what that means in English. The production function exhibits constant returns to scale in K and L. You double your capital labor, you double your output. Yes, exactly. No, so the, so a, a, another name, for the mathematical name for this is that it's linearly homogeneous. It's homogeneous of degree one. In other words, if you multiply capital and labor by some constant scalar, you're gonna multiply output by the same proportion. So as Ben says, if you double labor and you double capital, you double the amount of output that you produce, all right? The neoclassical production function exhibits constant returns to scale. In other words, it is homogeneous of degree one. Now that is an extremely important assumption, okay? Because it's gonna enable us to transform the variables in this model into a form that will give us a stationary model that we can actually solve for analytically. Okay, I won't get to that until the next class, but let's take a few minutes to review this mathematical concept called homogeneity, okay? So that brings me to definition one. If we let J be some integer, and we take some arbitrary function G, which maps from R J plus two into the reals, be homogeneous of degree M in X and R, which are both scalars, that's true if and only if G satisfies the following property. 
g evaluated at lambda x times, I'm sorry, lambda times x and lambda times y is equal to lambda to the m power times g evaluated at x and y for any scalar value of lambda. So the one that Ben pointed out was that lambda was equal to 2, right? But a homogeneous function should work for any particular scalar. And homogeneity of degree m means that g evaluated at lambda x and lambda y should be equal to lambda to the m times g, okay? Now it turns out that production functions that are linearly homogeneous, where we assume that m is equal to one, are very useful in economics because of the following theorem. And that is Euler's theorem, which is on page three of the lecture notes, okay? Euler's theorem says that let's suppose we take this arbitrary function g and we'll assume that it's differentiable in x and y. So these are the two variables that we're going to look at. And they have partial derivatives noted g sub x and g sub y, similar to what we wrote here for the production function. Um, if g is a function that is homogeneous of degree m in x and y, then Euler's theorem makes the following claim. M times G evaluated at X, Y, and Z should be equal to the partial of G with respect to X evaluated at X, Y, Z um, times X plus the partial of G with respect to the second argument Y times Y. And that's for any x and any y and any vector z we want to look at. Moreover, the functions g sub x and g sub y are themselves homogeneous of m minus 1. So if g is homogeneous of degree m, then g sub x times x plus g sub y times y is simply equal to m times g. And the partial derivatives themselves will be homogeneous of degree m minus 1. And you obviously can see what that means from this equation, right? Okay, so let's do a simple two or three line proof of Euler's theorem, okay? Let's take um, our function g, and we'll assume that it is homogeneous of degree m. So what does that imply? And by the way, I'm, this is more of a sketch of a proof. I'm not really good at doing the formal mathematical proofs, okay? So a lot of this is just a, a sketch. Um, if g is homogeneous of degree m, then this equation should be satisfied. g of x y z times lambda to the m is equal to g evaluated at lambda x lambda y z right for some scalar value of lambda right okay let's take the derivative of this equation with respect to lambda and see what we get well, lambda only appears here on the left-hand side. So if we take the derivative with respect to lambda, we get what? m lambda to the n minus 1 times g of x, y, z is equal to, well, here we have lambdas attached to the first two arguments, right? So it would be g sub x, the derivative of g with respect to x. And we've got to do the chain rule, right? So times lambda plus g sub y times lambda. No, 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 no. See, I'm already screwing up. I took the derivative with respect to lambda, right? So this should be g sub x times x plus g sub y times y. You don't gotta catch me on these math errors, okay? It'll take me a few days to get sharper as we start the semester. 
Okay, everybody got this so far? So we've just taken the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to lambda. Um, what if we allow, this is supposed to work for any scalar value of lambda, right? So what if we just set lambda equal to one? Then what do we get? We get m times one to the m minus one, that's just one, times g is equal to g of x, x plus g of y, y. And that is exactly the statement in Euler's theorem. The second part of Euler's theorem states that the partial derivatives themselves are homogeneous of degree n minus one. So again, we start with the equation that characterizes a homogeneous degree m function, that is lambda to the m times g is equal to g of lambda x lambda y z. Let's now take the derivative of that equation with respect to x as an example. This is what we get. So instead of taking the derivative with respect to lambda, Let's take the derivative with respect to x. We get lambda to the n g sub x is equal to g sub x times lambda. If you divide both sides of this equation by lambda, what do you get? Lambda to the n minus 1 g sub x equal to g sub x lambda x lambda y z. Therefore, the partial derivative g sub x is homogeneous of degree n minus 1. This is important because if we assume that the neoclassical production function is homogeneous of degree 1, and that means the marginal product of capital and labor are homogeneous of degree zero. All right. Furthermore, by Euler's theorem, what it tells us then is that the production function, think of this as f, can be written as f sub x, I'm sorry, f sub k times k plus f sub l times l. In other words, the amount of output produced in our economy can be divided into two parts, the returns to capital that is the marginal product of capital times the amount of capital in the economy plus the returns to labor. That is the marginal product of labor times the amount of labor employed. Okay, I'm out of time. Let me go ahead and stop there and then we will pick up on Monday where we left off talking about um, the assumptions of the neoclassical production function and we'll start to look at the solution of the solo model, um, this concept of a steady state and whether or not a steady state exists and if it's stable, okay? So be taking a look at the notes. Um, it's probably a little too early to start any of the problems. And like I said, there's no recitation this Friday, but, but be looking for one next Friday. Okay, I'm gonna end the meeting. Thanks guys.